Welcome to this first presentation on the historical development of African American language. I'm going to go right on into the discussion of the major theory that has been put forth on the historical development of African American speech, and that is what's called the Creole. And what I'm going to introduce to you today is another perspective that we want you to com comprehend in order to understand the infusion of Afrocentric uh, measures and in curriculum into the existing curriculum in the school district, and that is the Niger Congo ebonics or ethno-linguistic theory. The funded theory that has been put forth by the African American language has been what is called the Creole hypothesis. Some th this theory, what is separate or autonomous languages? A lingua franca. A lingua franca merely means a common language that is used by people who cannot communicate with each other in their mother tongues or their native languages. Uh, in case of then merging two languages together, the result is that you get what's called a hybrid language. And this hybrid language is called a pidgin. It is a mixed speech, and so often in the literature you will find the word mishpraka, meaning mixed speech. This hybrid pidgin language is supposed to be a blend. If you speak language A and someone else speaks language B, then it would represent basically language A with some influence of language B in it, or for the speaker of language B, they're speaking language B with a little language A in it. This is a hybrid language, and it's referred to as a pidgin. What the theory is, is that these pidgin languages that emerge as a result of the convergence of European and African languages, primarily the Portuguese, the Spanish, the French, the Dutch, and the English. Those are the four major Western European languages that converge with the West African languages. And as a result, they say that these pidgin languages developed on the coast of Africa as a transactional or trade lingua franca. All pidgins are lingua francas. Why? Because they facilitate communication for people who cannot speak to each other in their mother tongues. And so these pidgins then serve as a facilitator. But while all pidgins are lingua francas, not all lingua francas are pidgin. Let's say, for example, you had learned to speak language C, and I had learned to speak language C before we ever met each other. Since we both know how to speak language C, then language C would be able to uh, we would be able to facilitate communication with each other through the use of language C. Portuguese was considered one of the first major trade lingua francas during the early colonial period, and French at that same time was considered to be a major diplomatic lingua franca, meaning that people who spoke Middle Eastern and Far Eastern languages, many of them had learned to speak either Portuguese pidgin or had learned to speak French, and as a result, they were able to conduct trade and commerce and diplomatic affairs in these autonomous languages that they had learned to speak. They were not hybrids, they were languages such as French or some other language that would facilitate communication. The Portuguese pidgin, however, was considered to be more of a mixed speech because it had elements of Portuguese in it. Let me go a little further with this. When you have a pidgin now learned as a person's native language or mother tongue, that is, subsequent generations, if you spoke language B and you came to live in an area where language A is the dominant language, but now you're no longer exposed to the autochthonous language A. Autochthonous meaning the language spoken on the continent. I think that's the correct spelling. Autochthonous means if you're born on the soil of China, then you are an autochthonous Chinese person because you're born in the area of the national geographic area that is known as China. If you're born and you're a Chinese person but you're born dispersed, then we have the notion of people being descendants and related culturally to that nation of, of that people as that people in diaspora, D-I-A-S-P-O-R-A, -A, meaning born scattered. Autochthonous Jews are born in Israel those Jews born outside of Israel are Jews in diaspora. Autochthonous Africans then are born in Africa. Those born outside of Africa would be Africans in diaspora. And what we're saying then is that those Africans who were born in the diaspora, 
not exposed to the autochthonous African languages, are theoretically said to have acquired these pidgin languages as their native languages or mother tongues. And when you learn a pidgin or acquire a pidgin language as your mother tongue, you are by definition considered to be speaking Creole. Now, let's go to some specific African languages because that's important. In the book Africanisms in the Gullah Dialect, Lorenzo Turner, in his text, points out the areas that Africans were primarily brought from. He says here on chapter 1, page 1 here, the slaves brought to South Carolina and Georgia, direct from Africa, came principally from a section along the west coast, extending from Senegal to Angola. The important areas involved were Senegal, Gambia, Sierra Leone, Liberia, the Gold Coast, Togo, Dahomey, Nigeria, and Angola. And today the vocabulary of Gullah contains words found in the following languages. He gives you the ethnic specific groups from, African, from which African American language has derived. And that is the Wolof, Malinke, Mandinka, Bambara, Fula, Mindi, Vai, Hui, Fante, Ga, Iwe, Fon, Fo, Yoruba, Bini, Hausa, Ibo, Ibibio, Efi, Congo, Umbundu, and a few others. These are the specific African, or what we refer to as Niger-Congo African languages from which African Americans originally uh, came. These languages, though, uh, according to the Pigeon Creole hypothesis, were discontinued. And it is here that the Niger-Congo ethno-linguistic view differs with the uh, Creole hypothesis. The Creole hypothesis argues that the pidgin and Creole languages that emerged on the plantations were in fact the creation, the invention of the Portuguese and the French and the Dutch and the English and the Spanish colonials. That they spoke to the Africans in this invented or created language, this baby talk, and that this simplified version of the European language became in time the mother tongue or native language of the African Americans. That is the Creole hypothesis. That theory is rejected by those who put forth the Niger-Congo Ebonics or ethno-linguistic theory because they argue that the differences that consistently and presently exist in African-American speech can be traced to these very Niger-Congo languages. In other words, you're arguing discontinuity, you're claiming that the Africans broke with the African linguistic tradition and adopted a simplified version of a European language, yet when we look at the differences that presently exist in the speech of slave descendants of African Amer America into, uh, of African origin in the diaspora today, we find consistently evidence of those differences continuing to exist. What are these differences? Specific differences that you will find can be shown in the work of Peter Latifogan. He did a study of the West African languages, and you will see some of the same ethnic groups related to the Niger-Congo languages or the specific African Niger-Congo languages that I had just mentioned in the Africanisms in the Gullah dialect work. The Fula, the Wolof, the Mende, the Fante, the Twi, the Iwe, the Yoruba, Bini, Efik, Hausa, all of the same ethnic groups which are referred to as Niger-Congo languages are mentioned here in this study by Peter Latifoget, a phonetic study of West African languages. What does he say here with regards to those languages? He says that many West African languages, including most of the Kwa group, can be considered to have no consonant clusters. The decision as to whether to regard members of a particular sequence of consonants as single phonemic units or as clusters is, of course, often arbitrary. I have tried to include in Table 1 all of the contrasting consonants in at least those languages that have a simple CV structure. Uh, what Latifoget is sharing with us here is that the West African languages tend to have a very strong vowel, consonant vowel, consonant vowel phonemic pattern. Again, what he says is that many West African languages, including most of the what's called the Kwa group, can be considered to have no consonant clusters. And that is, any two or more consonants together in a sequence would be considered a consonant blend or consonant cluster. And he says that as a rule, in West African languages, the ones that he studied here, the very same ethnic groups that uh, we uh, as African Americans were brought from, are the ones that you do not find consonant blend or constant cluster configuration, that the tendency is that there is this CV, CV, CV vocalic pattern. What is the result of this CV, CV vocalic pattern? 
by what is called in linguistics relaxification. That is, when you speak a language but you don't know the phonology or the grammar rules of that language, the tendency is that speakers of languages that are different will tend to retain the phonological structure of their mother tongue and they will borrow words from the target language. In other words, knowing a language means more than just knowing the sounds of that language or knowing the vocabulary. What you need to know is how to shape words with that sound system, how to make past tense and present tense and future tense out of the verbs of that language. How do you modify the nouns with adjectives? Do you put the adjective in front or after the noun? If you don't know the grammar or the verb system of the language, then you're not considered to be a speaker of that language as a native speaker's intuitions would reflect. And what we have here is a concept called relexification, that is borrowing the words of a language but using them in the phonology, the deep phonology or syntax of another language. This is in phonetic script, and what we have here is ju-we-cho-jello. Ju-we-cho-jello. What did I say? Ju-we-cho-jello. Did you eat your jello? But you notice this strong con.